From Christianity Today, you're listening to The Bulletin. I'm Mike Cosper, the director of CT Media. My co-host, Russell Moore, is out this week, so I have two guests joining me for the conversations. First, New York Times columnist David French is going to join me. We're going to talk about events at CPAC last weekend, where Donald Trump and many others made speeches, and we're talking about things like retribution and the eradication of their enemies. Then, I'll be joined by Sonny Bunch, culture editor at The Bulwark. We'll be talking about the Oscars this weekend, what the award ceremony means, who the frontrunners are, and why, in his eyes, Maverick might have been dead the whole time. Stay with us. Joining me for these first couple of segments is David French. David was a constitutional lawyer and a journalist. For many years, he was with National Review and The Dispatch. And in January of this year, he joined The New York Times. David, welcome to the show. Well, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. So I want to start by talking about CPAC. And for people who aren't familiar with this, this is the Conservative Political Action Conference, an annual event that took place just this past weekend. Trump gave a speech that has made a lot of noise People have sort of been responding to it by saying like, okay, Trump is back. This is the old Trump. And we'll get to that in a minute. I want to start actually by sort of setting the context of what what else happened at the conference this weekend. Joe Walsh actually has a great summary of it at the Bulwark, and he pointed out a handful of things. One was that Steve Bannon accused Fox News of stealing the election. Marjorie Taylor Greene <laughs> right. accused the Ukraine of wanting Americans to die on their soil. They platformed Brazil's ex-president Bolsonaro, who claimed his election was stolen. They platformed Mike Lindell. That's criticism enough. My favorite, though, was a quote from Kerry Lake, who said that Steve Bannon, who's been you know, credibly accused of fraud, convicted of contempt of Congress, she called him our modern day George Washington. So let's start here, David. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what CPAC is and maybe what CPAC was, how it became what it is today. Yeah. So uh, it's so funny you ask me. I'm actually a former winner of the Ronald Reagan Award at CPAC <laughs> in a very different time, Mike. So this is, I believe, 2011 that I won the Ronald Reagan Award. So that's a dozen years ago at CPAC, was speaking at CPAC. And the way I would describe CPAC in what we'll call the before times, sort of the before Trump <laughs> times, was it always straddled the fence between the very sort of establishment intellectual conservative movement and sort of the more populist side of conservatism and had for a long time. And so it was sort of like, imagine a cross between a lobbyist and lawyers convention and the Moss Eisley Cantina from <laughs> Star Wars. So it was always an eclectic gathering, but you were going to go to CPAC and you were going to see almost everybody who was anybody in the conservative movement from the establishment to the populist side. And that was something that it was a very big tent organization. And so you were going to see in one package, sometimes the very best of conservatism. And then there was going to be folks milling around that represented the very worst of conservatism at the same time. So it was always a kind of a complex gathering but a lot of people I know and love had good experiences at CPAC for a long time. It had very different leadership several years ago. Then you fast forward to the Trump era. And CPAC, like, say, a Turning Point USA, went all in on Trump populism. And in many ways, it might even be more of a bleeding edge Trump populist institution now than even something like Turning Point, although they, they kind of compete with each other on that. And so what you saw at CPAC, and I, I can't remember who said this, this is the id of Trumpism is mm -hmm. CPAC. And so this is going to be a place that you're going to see. And, and one way I've diagnosed what's happened to sort of the Trumpist movement since 2020 is that it's narrowed and intensified. And I think you saw that at CPAC. Many of the speakers were speaking to half empty or mostly empty rooms. There was not a sense of sort of overwhelming momentum. It was narrowing, but it was also intensifying. And this is also the place where the id of the right, which is driving it in a particular kind of rhetorical direction, which is to greater confrontation, greater anger, anything that the media or what they perceive to be the old conservative establishment, anything that they want, the CPAC world will be against. 
And so it's an extremely contrarian, extremely aggressive, no enemies to my right, except Nick Fuentes, who they did draw the line at Nick Fuentes <laughs> uh, kind of gathering. And this is really where you're going to see, this is what dedicated right-wing Trumpist populism looks like in the United States right now. I think one of the questions that I'm wrestling with, having paid a little bit of attention to it over the last few years in particular, you know, you mentioned that attendance is down. One of its leaders, Matt Schlapp, is, you know, credibly accused of sexual harassment, sexual assault type claims. To what extent is the decline of CPAC, the lack of attendance, the lack of sort of mainstream politicians, a lot of, you know, the potential presidential hopefuls, Nikki Haley being a notable exception, a lot of them stayed away. Yeah. No Ron DeSantis, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Ron DeSantis stayed away. Is that a positive sign to you that it seems to be in decline? We'll see. <laughs> Because what we have seen is that a minority of the party can seize the party and then present the whole rest of the party with that binary choice argument and carry along with it 90, 95, 98% of everybody else. And so it could be, Mike, right now that we sit there and we look at back at this, if we if we fast forward to you know mid-2024 and we're getting ready for a Republican convention that does not have Donald Trump being uh, crowned once again. Then we look back and we say, well, that was the sign of the decline. You know, if you look at the results of 2018, the results of 2020, the results of 2022, then you look at the way in which CPAC just seemed to lack its cultural cachet on the right that it traditionally had. All of this is pointing to the direction where we ultimately ended, which is the end of Trump in the Republican Party. I think at this point, if you made me bet, at this point, it's more likely that the plurality, that hardcore Trump base stays with him. And mm -hmm. it's more likely that we're looking at in 2024, Trump being the winner of the primary again, at which point everyone is going to be asked to consolidate around something that is even more extreme and more angry than the Trumpism of 2016 and the Trumpism of 2020. And they're going to be told that if they don't consolidate around this thing that is more extreme, that is more angry, that is more conspiracy driven, that you're somehow not a Christian, that you want babies to be killed, and that you have no choice. You have no moral choice. You have to back all of this. And that is a very possible outcome as well. I don't know which way it'll turn out. I'm sort of in a pessimistic moment after I've seen a number of polls that indicate mm -hmm. that Trump is still the overwhelming front runner. Sort of the DeSantis boom may be fading a little bit. So I'm in a point where I have a bit more pessimism than I did right after November 2022, when it did seem for a while that a lot of Republicans who'd been Trump friendly we're saying, wait a minute, this movement is really running us into the rocky shoals of political defeat and right. failure. I sense less of that now. Yeah. I mean, that brings us to Trump's speech, which has gotten a lot of attention. Something I've been saying since he announced last fall that he was running again is that my sense of it was that he hadn't really started yet. You know, people were like, right. oh, the announcement speech, because it was a very low energy speech. It was very uncompelling. Most of his speeches have been fairly unremarkable. But then, you know, he goes to Ohio after this train derailment in Ohio, and he's kind of in his old form. He's wearing the hat. He's handing out McDonald's sandwiches. He's there to sort of feel the pain of the people. And then he comes to CPAC. And to me, Trump at CPAC was like, okay, there's the old yeah. Donald Trump. He's He's loose. He's making jokes. He's saying, they don't want me to tell you this. Like he's going off script or at least like performing going off script, depending on kind of who you believe in all of that. I actually have a clip that I want to play and then throw a couple of questions your way. Thank you, Monica. Thank you very much. And if you put me back in the White House, their reign is over. Their reign will be over. And they know it. And America will be a free nation once again. We're not a free nation right now. We don't have free press. We don't have free anything. In 2016, I declared, I am your voice. Today, I add, I am your warrior. I am your justice. And for those who have been wronged and betrayed, I am your retribution. I am your retribution. Uh, so listeners of the show will know that I'm fond in any discussion of politics here at the Bulletin. Uh, I'm fond of quoting Jonah Ryan from Veep. Um, <laughs> 
in his own campaign announcement when he announced he was running for president. He said, uh, let's send them a message by shoving the guy they hate most right back in their faces. <laughs> uh, so I couldn't help but think of that line as I hear him say, I'm, I'm your retribution. And you hear the applause line, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the cheers, the applause line. This is exactly what Trump voters love. What is it about that that works? What works is it absolutely positively fits like a glove within the negative polarization of our current political climate. So you have the most important characteristic of any partisan right now, or the most important motivation for partisans right now is opposition. It's opposition to the left or opposition to the right. The Democrats, I think, are a bit more unified around what it means ideologically to be a Democrat. The Republicans have a lot of confrontation about what it means ideologically to be a Republican, but Republicans are very united and Democrats are also very united in the idea that our opponents are bad people. They are terrible people. And the subset of the GOP that is the heart of the Trump base are the people who are most motivated by the view that the other side is horrible and evil and awful. And so if you are feeling as if they're horrible and they're evil and they're awful, and then you add on top of this, the sort of the very popular right-wing talking point that we have lost every major cultural institution and all we have left is the political world and the political realm. That's all we can win. And so therefore you begin to see why he can craft a narrative that says, I am, and it's more aggressive than guardian, right? It's more <laughs> aggressive than I will defend your rights because the animosity is so great that it's not just that people want to defend themselves from their political opponents. They actually want to punish their political opponents. And you see this in the mm -hmm. ideology of national conservatism, which often will explicitly say we reward friends and punish enemies. Mm -hmm. And so the ideology that is so driven by animosity that it's not defensive. You know, when I, when I was a religious liberty lawyer and I still dabble, I wrote an amicus brief in the 303 creative case on behalf in supporting 303 creative in the Supreme Court this term. But when I was engaged in my religious liberty practice, the goal of it was to expand the sphere of liberty so that you had freedom against the state but you weren't trying to take over the state. In other words, you weren't trying to wield the power of the state to advance a specifically, for example, religious end. You were saying in the sphere of our private organization, our campus ministry, our youth ministry in this particular town or the church in this particular town, we as a body of Christ need the liberty to reach our neighbors and to speak freely. We don't need the government to be our instrument. We just kind of really need to be left alone to accomplish our ministry. And the interesting sort of story is that over the next many years, that liberty was largely won. The goals of the religious liberty legal movement have been largely, though not entirely, but largely accomplished. And the response is not, now we are free to perform our Christian mission. The answer is now much more, well, but what about the retribution? <laughs> what about <laughs> what about the the owning of the libs? What in, about the defeat, the total defeat of our enemies? And mm -hmm. that's where you see that turn, this turn away from we just need freedom in this land to speak truth into right. we need power in this land to defeat our foe. And that's a different thing. I think part of the issue as well, to take it back a step from there, is that most of the people I know who would embrace that Christian populist vision, that Christian nationalist vision, would resist the idea that religious liberty battles have been largely won over the last few decades. Because the narrative is a narrative of decline. And, you know, I was listening to Russell Moore's show this week. He talked with Rick Warren, and, and Rick Warren made a comment that, you know, I've heard other places, but it just struck me as relevant to this conversation, which is that demographically, Christianity is moving to the global south. Mm -hmm. And people are always talking about, you know, in the States, we're always talking about that the, the cultural momentum for the U.S. is to look more and more like secularized Europe. So I think that decline narrative weighs heavily in people's minds. And one of the things that makes me think about is there's this passage in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 30, 15 through 17, and it's a 
It's a passage people love where it says, you know, in repentance and rest is your salvation and quietness and trust is your strength. People love that. You buy the version of it that's handwritten in, you know, Hobby Lobby and you hang it on your wall. Well, the next verse is essentially, well, you'll have none of that. We'll have none of this. <laughs> um, we we put our trust in, in, in horses. And it kind of says, like, we're going to trust horses. We're going to get help from Egypt. And it's this very clear contrast where God is saying to these exiles who are surrounded by paganism, like, hey, repent of your sins and live quietly and the Lord's going to rescue you. And they're saying, well, yeah, we're going to actually bargain with Egypt. We're going to reach for the tools of power. And God warns them like, hey, if you, if you reach, you know, verse 17, if you reach for the tools of power, power's going to crush you. Like they're going to match you horse yeah. for horse. They're going to match you strength for strength. And so it just strikes me when you think about the Christian vision of faithful presence in the world, that Christians are a mustard seed, you know, and that Christian history as well, Christians sort of living as this remnant that has a faithful witness throughout various empires that have tried to crush it and the rest of it. It seems so obviously and strangely misguided to think, but maybe it's just a deeply human instinct to go, well, let's look for the nearest tool of power at hand to reclaim ground lost or to push back or to fight back which is the dominant voice right now. I'm glad you went all the way back to Isaiah because we're talking about a millennia old human temptation. I mean, this mm -hmm. is a universal human temptation. And look with the story of Jesus. One of his temptations was, here are all the kingdoms, right? right. You know, it reminds you of uh, the fictional version of that is Frodo offering Galadriel the ring, right? Mm -hmm. So here are all the kingdoms you can rule. And Jesus says, no who is fully capable, he doesn't need Satan to offer him the kingdoms, right? They, mm -hmm. they weren't right. actually Satan's to offer in that, in that way, but he has the authority to seize that power, whether Satan offers it or not. And he says, no, he says, no. And then you fast forward to the choice that was put before the people of Jerusalem between Jesus, who was forsaking the attack on the Roman empire and Barabbas, who was not just a common criminal, but, you know, historical evidence that he was a zealot, that he was a insurrectionist, that they went for the insurrection over Jesus. And so there was a symmetry. He was offered one thing and he said no. And then the people were offered the same thing and they said yes. And that was the wrong choice. And then you read the Pauline epistles and look, if there was ever a decadent and oppressive society, it was Rome. I mean, and if there was ever like a world in which Christianity was greeted with overt hostility. It was that time in world history. And while it's obvious that Paul, in, in, in Paul's writing, it's quite obvious that he stands in opposition to the culture and the zeitgeist of the Roman Empire, it's also quite obvious that he spends the bulk of his writing calling the church to righteousness, to holiness, to goodness. And then when he's talking about persecution— and when he's talking about interacting and engaging with the world, it isn't about drinking Roman tears. You know, it's <laughs> loving your enemies. It's praying for those who persecute you. It's right. what are the fruit of the Spirit? And he's telling us what the fruit of the Spirit are in a world that is so much more hostile to Christianity that we can't conceive of it. It's very interesting to me when you just try to pull back and get some perspective on where we are as a country where people will say, man, America is so hostile to Christianity. Just look at what they did when, what was it, Princeton revoked a prize given to Tim Keller? Well, let's walk that back to the lens of first century Christian. You would begin the story like this. Well, let me tell you how bad we got in America in, in the 20 teens. I was in the 20 teens when this happened, I think. Well, there's this celebrity pastor, and they'd be, hold on. <laughs> right. Hold on just a minute. What is a, what's a pastor who's got a huge following? Well, how big? Millions mm -hmm. of people. Wait, millions of people have read his work? And he pastors a mega church. Wait, hold the phone. What is a mega church? Right. And so it's just this lack of perspective. And that is in no way to say that Christians shouldn't. And I firmly believe, I'm a firm believer in religious liberty. I'm a firm believer in Christians offering a moral perspective and a moral voice towards orienting a culture towards justice. So, you know, I'm not somebody who says Christians pull back, Christians pull back, but our objective is justice. And we've substituted that with power and have presumed that the justice will follow if we obtain power. 
And history demonstrates that that's not always the case. And in fact, history has shown us frequently that's the opposite of the case. That's well put. We will be right back. So, David, another thing that happened this week that's gotten some press from CPAC was one of the speakers, his name is Michael Knowles. He's a journalist for The Daily Wire. In his speech, he began to talk a lot about transgenderism. We have a clip that we will play. There can be no middle way in dealing with transgenderism. It is all or nothing. If transgenderism is true, if men really can become women, then it's true for everybody of all ages. If transgenderism is false, as it is, If men really can't become women, as they cannot, then it's false for everybody, too. And if it's false, then we should not indulge it, especially since that indulgence requires taking away the rights and customs of so many people. If it is false, then for the good of society, and especially for the good of the poor people who have fallen prey to this confusion, transgenderism must be eradicated from public life entirely. The whole preposterous ideology. So David, I don't know about you, my skin crawls when I hear someone talk about a sort of whole group of people and say, yeah, their ideology must be eradicated from society. There are historical implications with that kind of thinking and and speaking that are pretty bad. And yet at the same time, as Christians, as people who believe that God created the world, created men, male and female, that there's a goodness to the way that God made men and women as men and women. This is an issue that we should care about. We do care about. So let me start here. When you hear a comment like that, I guess I have two questions with it. One, how reflective of sort of reality and of the spirit of the conservative movement is that? And how do you begin to place it in context with the broader conversation that's happening right now around transgenderism? Yeah. So He's absolutely representative of what I would call the online right. And if you're online, and hopefully if you're listening to this podcast, you're not. <laughs> hopefully <laughs> hopefully you're not on Twitter. And I say that knowing that, yes, I'm on Twitter. I wrestle with, is this something necessary for my job or not? But I'm there. But if you're in the online right, and Mike, as you know, this is absolutely representative of the sentiment of the online right. The online right spends an enormous amount of time on transgenderism. I mean, just an absolutely enormous amount of time. And not only do they put that amount of time on that issue, they do two things with it. One, they sort of use it as a litmus test for their own courage, like because transgenderism is such a hot button topic. They use the fact that they will talk about this all the time as sort of a demonstration of how brave and courageous they are. And then What they do is they take their prioritization of the issue and then say to everyone else who's Christian, if you're not sharing our prioritization of the issue, you're a coward. So it's an obsession with much of the online right, and it's a weapon in much of the online right. And let me just say before I say anything else, I'm not a squish on issues of sexual morality. Like, I signed the Nashville statement. (laughs) All right. (laughs) I signed the Nashville statement. Which, for context, the Nashville statement was a sort of convictional theological statement about gender and sexuality. And it was sort of very mainstream conservative evangelical. In fact, it was probably on the leading sort of more conservative than some, than a lot of mainstream evangelicals would say. I mean, I have a lot of friends who signed it. I have a lot of friends who would very much align with historic confessions about gender, who felt like there was some language in there that they were uncomfortable with. So the fact that you signed it is an indication, like for a lot of people, you'd be like, oh, he's very conservative. Right, exactly. On these issues. Like, exactly. So. That that would say, oh, yeah, he's very conservative on matters of sexuality and gender identity, et cetera. So let's break this down a little bit. So, one, a big part of that is what you would call LARPing, live action role play. And LARPing is when somebody goes into the woods and they put on like cardboard armor and they have a plastic sword and they reenact medieval battles or they simulate medieval battles. It's it's looks kind of fun, you know, it's a former Dungeons and Dragons guy, like I'm not casting aspersions, but nobody would say that they're engaging in medieval combat, right? And so a lot of the online right is they're LARPers. I stand 
for the eradication of the ideology of my enemy. They have no ability to do that. None at all. It's posturing. And then the way that he said it, let's also realize it's a game because he's trying to trigger a particular reaction. So he's he's using words like eradicate transgenderism, which the word eradicate has a really rough connotation to it. But then he says, but it's not transgender people, it's transgenderism. So how dare you say that I have eliminationist rhetoric? And so there, you've deliberately chosen words to provoke a maximum reaction with some hedge terms to defend yourself against that maximum reaction and then cast yourself as the victim. Classic trollish behavior. But if you want to know what's wrong with this, and this really gets, Mike, to what is our conception of how we live in a pluralistic society and how power should be exercised in a pluralistic society? Because here's the defense to him. The defense would be like, wait a minute. If you're talking about how he defines transgenderism, the the belief that a man can be a woman or a woman can be a man or a man can be pregnant or a woman can have a penis or whatever, that that's wrong. And we need to dispute and debate and to defeat wrong ideas. That's all he means, right? That's all he means. But is it though? Because let's change some words here. I would say that your typical Christian listener does not believe that Islam is correct, that Islam is a faithful reproduction of the Word of God, that the Quran and Islamic theology are not faithful reproductions of the Word of God or the theology of the creator of the universe. And so therefore that Islam is wrong. Now, what if someone got up and said, we will eradicate Islam from American life? Right. And just fill in another religion. Think about exactly how that lands. Exactly how that lands is as an act of power, we will eliminate this viewpoint from the United States of America. And that is utterly contrary to the constitutional structure of our government, which actually affirmatively protects dissenting points of view. It doesn't aim to eradicate them. It actually goes out of its way to protect dissenting points of view. And so when you look at it like that, you realize, oh, wait a minute, this is a grab for power. This is not about a debate that we hope to win, but power we hope to impose on others. Well, if you're going to go so far as to eradicate, eradicate, again, a very intentionally chosen word, then you're going to be expanding the power of government dramatically beyond Mm -hmm. its current boundaries, if you're wanting to actually eradicate. And Mm -hmm. so when you look at it like that and you realize, okay, let's substitute another word, you realize this is deeply troublesome from the standpoint of the structure of this country, the way in which we protect minority rights in this country, the way in which we protect dissent in this country, the way in which the country in its best form is set up to allow multiple communities who have competing worldviews to live with integrity within their worldview without oppressing or suppressing another person's rights. This is the essence of American pluralism. And so, you know, part of the thing that I've seen happen to me personally is that on the one hand, I, you know, I've signed the Nashville statement. And then years ago, I said, when there was earlier iterations of this conversation about transgenderism, One of the things that I said earlier, which was naive and wrong, was that I wasn't seeing any movement on the right to strip trans people of their constitutional rights. And if such a movement emerges, it should be resisted vigorously. Well, that movement began to emerge and I resisted it. And I said that, you know, no matter who you are, whether you're gay, straight, trans, drag queen, whatever that you enjoy the same rights as everybody else. You enjoy the same constitutional rights. And then you get scorched, you get vilified because the movement has shifted away from, we have a debate over a very, very serious issue and much more towards, we are going to use whatever power we can achieve to suppress the core civil liberties of our political opponents, especially in this area. And that becomes... 
a different thing entirely. And that's the core issue. And then there's this other element, Mike, that I think is really dangerous. And this is when you take the vitriolic obsession that you see in much of the right Twitter world, and I mean vitriolic and obsession towards the trans community in the U.S., in this tinderbox of a country, you are in many ways going to be contributing to an atmosphere that can lead to violence. We've seen it. And then to have the sort of gall to say, unless you share my vitriolic obsession with limiting the constitutional rights of another population of Americans, you're a coward right. and not a real Christian. What on earth? It's just unbelievable. And again, I say this as somebody who takes a very different position from many of my friends on the left on that question that was asked in the popular documentary, what is a woman, right? right. Again, I'm right. somebody who has signed the Nashville statement. I do not believe that a right. man can be pregnant. <laughs> And, but at the same time, I want every single American to enjoy the same degree of constitutional protections, the same degree of liberty. And I do not want to see any population of Americans singled out for invidious discrimination. Yeah, I thought a lot about this recently. And one of the things I think makes this conversation hard is that there are incentives and it's seemingly incentives at both sort of fringe edges of this yeah. argument there are incentives to blur some really important distinctions because it's one thing to talk about a 30 year old trans woman who's lived with gender dysmorphia their entire life and wants to live life as a woman and in a sense sort of wants to be left alone and live life as a woman, right? I have moral and ethical objections to the ideology there, but let's just leave it as, okay, this is one phenomenon. Another phenomenon is the drag queen phenomenon, which has become this sort of part of the mainstream discussion with these issues. And then you have a third layer of this, which is related to what's happening with children and the language that's used as gender affirming care. I mean, mm -hmm. I think the language is kind of Orwellian, but it's nonetheless, this idea that you are using medical interventions to block children from going through puberty or hormone treatments for children under 18 or surgical options for children under 18. To me, I think it's really important that you separate the three issues to yeah, discuss them I agree with that. in different ways. And I think that's one of the things that fails in this conversation constantly. Because, I, I mean, I've seen this, you see it in, in news coverage of these things, you see it online, like you said, the very online right. The distinctions are blurred immediately, where you might be able to say like, hey, look, I think, I, you know, I, I made the mistake of doing this recently. Um, I, you know, I think drag queen story hour is sort of insidious and stupid, but it's one of those things that in a pluralistic society, these things are going to exist. And what was interesting to me about the reaction to that comment was that it immediately became a conversation about gender affirming care for kids. Right. That's a different thing. It's a different that's a thing. That's a totally different conversation. Yes. And I think that's what makes it so difficult is if we don't make those kinds of distinctions about, okay, where do we draw lines? What do we advocate for publicly? Then we end up in this very difficult place, which I think is where you found yourself for the last number of years, where people are demanding you defend something that you don't believe. Right. While you're also saying, look, the nature of pluralism is that we're going to live with lots of people who believe wild and crazy things that we don't. Yeah. I mean, look, as I've said countless times, I don't like Drag Queen Story Hour. I, I would never take my kids. And not, for the record, neither do I. Yeah. Never take my grandchildren. Um, no. I don't like Drag Queen Story Hour. There's a lot of expression in this country I don't like. But you know what? I have defended free expression that I don't like my entire career. Because I'm a believer in the constitutional structure of our government. I'm a believer in, there's this sort of basic golden rule principle that I apply. I like to defend the rights of others that I would like to exercise myself. I'm a believer in the Frederick Douglass defense of free speech from 1860, where he calls free speech the great moral renovator of society and government. It's a fundamental right. He calls it the dread of tyrants. And so this idea that I'm going to throw out core free speech doctrine because there's this community of drag queens that I'm never going to attend one of their events who host these small events scattered around the country that I'm going to upend First Amendment jurisprudence over that strikes me as nuts. It just strikes me right. as, as crazy to upend First Amendment jurisprudence to deal with that. And then the other thing, Mike, and let's get very real here. 
one of the reasons why there is such an obsession with drag queens, for example, is that is a they problem. It's not like drag queens are very commonly found in evangelical churches. And it's not like the right, well, with the exception, say, of George Santos and some others, it's not like the right is overrun with drag queens. So the drag queen issue becomes a they problem. It's something that people can rally around in the evangelical right and say, we don't have, this is what they are doing. Look how bad they are. And then you throw the kids into it when this is what they're doing in front of kids. And you know, look, what we do in the evangelical world is we defend kids. They say, as Canna Camp is packed to the gills every summer, in spite of the fact that the lead prosecutor in one of the worst sexual abuse scandals you've never heard of said that he believed, he told my wife and I, a lead prosecutor in a case, that he believed that up to hundreds of boys had been sexually abused in one Christian camp by one person over a period of years. And we found multiple, multiple other abusers at that camp. And you won't see all of the defenders of children in the online right rallying to this cause. Why? Because that is a we problem, not a they problem. And it is a lot easier to talk about the they problems. It fits in with the sort of the narrative of the Christian communities and battled guardians of the truth who are facing overwhelming negative cultural odds. And we're the last courageous warriors on the walls of Jerusalem against the invading Assyrian army. When the reality is that in so many ways, the call is coming from inside the house. And so it's just really hard to take seriously this idea that these people are mounting to the barricades for the children when for the children, they often won't even turn an eye towards what's happening in our own community, right? And so again, and I'm with you, like we need to break these things out. And I think that this term gender affirming care, I like that you use the word Orwellian. And if you're talking about life changing, body altering treatments for minor children, often prescribed without sufficient studies, often undertaken without a sufficient kind of even basic sort of waiting period, you're going to see malpractice awards eventually on this mic that you can see from space as a result of some of this quote unquote treatment that will blow your mind because of the way in which kids were rushed into permanently life altering treatments, often in good faith, like parents who love their kids desperately, who are trying to deal with a completely unexpected issue that they never imagined and often in good faith, but without sufficient informed consent, without sufficient studies, without sufficient information. And, and I think you're going to see some, a real reckoning on that point to come. But you know what? You can do all of that reckoning within the existing American legal system, which protects free speech, which protects the civil liberties of minority populations. It's this idea that you have to stampede over basic American civil liberties to get at this culture war issue is, a, to me, a real problem. And I, my only comment that I'd add is, is I think there's a need for Christians to have confidence in the truth to win out. And I think exactly what you're describing is reflective of that, that in time, the truth, the moral obviousness of these things will prove themselves out. So, David, thanks for joining us. Our final segment today is going to be about the Oscars. I, I thought I'd just, uh, before we go, even though you're notorious for terrible taste in movies. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> I, I wanted to see, do you, uh, I, I mean, I think I know the answer to this. Do you have a pick for uh, best picture for Sunday? Oh, Top Gun Maverick, man. That's what I figured. That's oh, I figured. of course. It is high time that the Oscars actually come back to what it used to do with some regularity, which is award the Oscar to the best popular movie of the year. Um, and <laughs> Top Gun Maverick is a tour de force, Mike. It is a masterpiece. I've gone back on YouTube and rewatched the sequence where Maverick does the bo simulated bomb run in like two and a half minutes or whatever it is, probably 30 times. Like that's great cinema right there. You know, I saw it twice on IMAX in the theater the first time middle third row. I felt like I was almost taking off from the aircraft carrier. It was so loud and big. Yeah, that's that's movie making right there. So what about you? 
my pick, I mean, I love Top Gun Maverick. I'll be very happy if it wins. I'm I'm 100% fine with that. But my pick would be Everything Everywhere All at Once. I mm. think there's so much to the storytelling of that movie, the acting. I mean, I could I could talk for a long time about that movie. So, yeah. Well, David, thank you for joining us on the bulletin. And uh, hopefully this is the first of many visits from you. And uh, we hope uh, you enjoy the rest of your day. Well, thanks so much for having me. So this weekend, the Oscars are airing, and joining me for a conversation about the Oscars and about the films nominated is Sonny Bunch. Sonny Bunch is the culture editor for The Bulwark, the host of The Bulwark Goes to Hollywood podcast. It's a great show. He actually had a great episode this last weekend with a guy named Michael Schulman. It's titled The Drama Behind Hollywood's Biggest Night. And for movie buffs, people interested in the Oscars, it's definitely worth listening to. I want to give a caveat before we get into talking about movies. Alyssa Wilkinson, who's a a writer for Vox now, she used to review films for CT. She told me a story a few years ago that at one point she reviewed The Wolf of Wall Street for CT. And at the time, CT had a movie ratings, like a star ratings system for movies. So she reviews The Wolf of Wall Street. She really liked the movie. She gave it four stars. A reader got on the website, saw the four star review, didn't read the review and decided, oh, this would be a great movie to go see this weekend and brought her 12 and 14 year old children. So please take all of this conversation about the films, not as commendations, make your own decisions, check common sense media for content, et cetera. Caveat emptor. Okay. Sonny Bunch, welcome to the bulletin. Uh, thanks for having me on. I mean, I, you know, I'm not going to tell you to send your 11 year old out to go see uh, the Banshees of Inishirin or anything, but uh, or Triangle <laughs> of Sadness, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Well, let's start sort of big picture. You know, Hollywood has, there's a million film awards, acting awards these days. Why do the Oscars matter to Hollywood in particular? You referred to it on your podcast last weekend, Hollywood's Biggest Night. Why is it Hollywood's Biggest Night? I mean, it's, it's an interesting question to think about, to to just take a step back and and think about, you know, what is the actual purpose of the Oscars? I am of one opinion. I'm of a slightly different opinion than most people in the industry in that I think the Oscars are less about judging absolute total. These are the best movies. Here are the achievements and arts. And this is what we should celebrate. And it's actually a giant industry trade show. It is Hollywood saying to the world, these are the things we make. These are the things that people enjoy, and they are of high quality. They have value to them, and what we make matters. This is why what we make matters. Again, that's a slightly different perspective than I think a lot of folks in the industry would say. Uh, I had a I had a guy on my podcast, Bulwark Goes to Hollywood, named Kevin Getz. Fantastic guest. I've had him on a couple of times, uh, and he is a member of the Academy. He votes in the Oscars. And I've said this to him, and he's like, yeah, Sonny, I know, I know that that's all true. But, you know, we're still artists. We still are voting on the things that we think are best, and that is really all that matters. Um, and the reason this distinction is important is because Hollywood is in kind of a weird place right now where the biggest budget, spectacle, audience pleasing stuff tends to not be very, to say it is not good is is not right exactly, but it is not awards caliber stuff, right? It's not like the 90s, right? Where you had movies like Braveheart or um, Forrest Gump or Saving Private Ryan that were both relatively big, successful movies and also quality pictures that people wanted to reward running up through, you know, Gladiator or I don't know, American Beauty, like movies that did well at the box office and did well at the awards. There was a lot more overlap that that used to be the case in recent years. If you just look at the box office of the winning films or if you take the box office of all the nominated films, the amount of money that they make has been trending steadily downward. And this was a problem that the Academy had hoped they could fix after 2008. So the 2009 Oscars were mildly controversial because in 2008, The Dark Knight was not nominated for Best Picture. And everybody was like, well, how can you not nominate this towering achievement of comic book cinema? And I was one. I was one, I'm among them. I, I believe that that was a Travis Sham mockery of justice. But the Academy said, OK, we're going to nominate 10 movies. We're going to have room for bigger movies and smaller movies and everything's going to work out. And some years that did work out. I mean, in 2000, the 2010 Oscars, Avatar, the biggest film ever made, 
in terms of box office, was nominated for Best Picture. Past doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Avatar The Way of Water, of course, this year is nominated once again. And this year is actually was a very good year for big budget spectacle type movies getting nominated. Avatar The Way of Water, you know, grossed $2.2 billion or so, so far, got nominated. Um, the Top Gun Maverick got nominated for Best Picture. The movie that will probably end up winning most of the major categories, Everything Everywhere All at Once, is a, is a relatively big hit. I mean, I think it's grossed 75, 78 million dollars, something like that domestically, 100 million worldwide. But it's like it's done well. It's done better than some of the movies in recent past movies like, you know, last year's Best Picture winner Coda was a nice little movie, but it was a little movie. It was only on Apple TV Plus. It had a very limited run in theaters. Basically, nobody really saw it. And you you get you we've had more movies like that in recent years. And I think the Academy is worried about the, the Academy worries about this for two reasons. One is that, you know, those movies are all well and good, but that's not how Hollywood keeps running. Hollywood doesn't right. run right. on movies like Moonlight. And on top of that, it's also bad for the show because it kills ratings. Because if you have a bunch of movies that are nominated that nobody saw, you know, if this year all 10 of the Best Picture nominees were movies like Tar. Tar is my favorite movie of the year. Great movie. I loved it. Really interesting. Lots of stuff to discuss. Gross. No money in theaters. Nobody in the right. general public has seen this movie. Um, right. So, you know, you, you can't have 10 movies like Tar get nominated and still expect people to watch the show, which is a problem for the Academy because the way they make the money, the way they pay for their whole organization is the Oscars, basically. Yeah, it seems like there's always these parallel and sometimes intersecting tracks of like a film had artistic success, a film had commercial success. And it's like in a dream world, they get both, but oftentimes they don't. I mean, I find myself like... I love film. I love movies. I, I wrote a book about TV and movies a, a decade ago. And I'm a Christian who like, I'll cry at every Terrence Malick film, right? But oftentimes I see the list of nominees and there is a part of me that you see some of the films that get nominated and there's a, there's a part of me that reacts and goes, do I want to put myself through two hours of the pain and heartache of a great film that's also a sort of a, a, of a gut wrencher? That was why to me this year, seeing Top Gun Maverick nominated really kind of surprised me. I mean, I saw the movie. I liked the movie a lot. And I heard a lot of people saying, oh, it should be best picture because it's the, the best movie that came out or it's the movie that was the most entertaining. But it genuinely surprised me because I can't remember a time a movie that was genuinely that sort of celebrative, joyful, triumphant, especially had that kind of critical success to get a to get an Oscar nomination. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. You know, I, a, a few years back, Black Panther was nominated for Best Picture, which was a huge box office success, obviously huge critical success. And that's the other thing is that like, you know, it's not like the Marvel movies from 2000 and basically 12 to 2019 weren't also critical successes. I mean, they were, are, they're all fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. They're, they, they all had great cinema scores. They all made huge amounts of money at the box office. It's, it's not like there, there hasn't been, you know, critical acclaim for them. I mean, they just aren't awards caliber films. They, they like, that's not the, the sort of thing that Hollywood is really set up to reward, or at least it's not what the Oscars are set up to reward. Hollywood is sure. set up to reward the, the Marvel not Cinematic Universe. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. to, to channel Don Draper, right? That's what the money is for. That's like, that is, you know, that is, <laughs> Those are movies that have been rewarded for being great successes. Um, it's just a different kind of reward. So looking at this year then, like there has been some criticism. I, I was listening to the New Yorker podcast the other day and both of the film critics that they talked to for that made a comment like that there was a sense of pandering in terms of who was nominated and what was nominated this year. Again, obviously not about a movie like like Tar, but the fact that you have these blockbusters like Avatar and, and Maverick in there. Do you think there's any truth to that at all? I mean, pandering is a strong word. That's a loaded term. Mm -hmm. I would not use that word. I think the Academy did make a concerted effort to get more popular films into the discussion, but it helps that, again, these are actual cinematic achievements and triumphs. I mean, nobody who has come out of Top Gun Maverick has been like, that was a bad movie. I like right. it's it's almost literally true. It's almost literally like if you look at the verified audience score on Rotten Tomatoes have like 10,000 ratings and it was 99% fresh. I mean, it may it may have even been 100% fresh. I, again, Avatar the Way of Water is a staggering cinematic technical achievement if nothing else. Right. So Another question I, I wanted to, to hear your thoughts on is that like the movies Hollywood makes and the movies that we celebrate, the movies that people show up to see, they're often reflective of kind of the moment, right? We live in this weird time. We live in a, a time where things are super polarized, super divided. We're coming out of this sort of three-year COVID hibernation. 
Are you seeing anything thematically that's showing up in the films nominated this year that is representative of anything that we've been through in the last few years? I don't know. It's an interesting question. I, I do think there are movies that have been nominated that reflect certain things that are going on in the culture for sure. Like, for instance, Women Talking, but is obviously very, very clearly a reaction to kind of the Me Too moment and, you know, Hollywood's essentially allowed abuse of women for decades. Triangle of Sadness is is a very interesting movie about the kind of nature of our various divisions. My favorite scene, my favorite scene in that movie, I don't know if, again, Triangle Sadness, not a movie that a lot of people saw at the box office, more I think have seen it at home on, on demand, but not a huge hit. But my favorite scene in that movie is there's a, there's a rich Russian capitalist and the captain of the boat is, he describes himself as an American Marxist and, they're, and they, they have an argument with each other. But it's not really an argument. It's just them reading quotes from different political figures off their phones at each other. So the the Russian capitalist, you know, here's a quote from Milton Friedman. And then uh, the American captain who's played by Woody Harrelson is like, here's a quote from Karl Marx. And it's the, it, it is the perfect representation of our dumb moment in terms of the debates we're having. I don't think there's a overarching theme that kind of unites all of these different movies, but there's definitely things that you can find in each of them that relates to stuff we're seeing. So of the films nominated, then you've already mentioned, you mentioned everything everywhere all at once. It leads the nomination race. It's 11 nominations this year. What was it about that film that you think attracted that kind of attention from the Academy? I mean, Everything Everywhere All at Once is a movie that has benefited greatly from the Academy's efforts to make the body of voters younger and more international. I mean, there there was a movement a couple of years back within the Academy itself to kind of diversify. But the, the Everything Everywhere All at Once phenomenon does a couple of different things. I mean, it, it hits all of the action pleasure centers that have been activated by the market. Marvel style movies in the last few years. It plays with and kind of makes fun of the idea of the multiverse concept that is so big in popular culture right now from, you know, the Marvel movies to also, I mean, frankly, the DC movies now to also uh, Rick and Morty, all sorts of, of stuff. It hits on the kind of visual pleasure centers that Hollywood has produced in recent years and also has like a real emotional core to it. I mean, the, the family dynamics there are really good. They transcend age differences and, and generational differences. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I mean, there's something to sort of even the pace of the editing. It's you can see how it would appeal to like the TikTok generation or people who are used to sort of flipping things on reels because it moves at a tremendous pace. Any other sort of major predictions or anything else to stand out? I mean, this podcast is going to air on Friday. Let's assume people have time to watch one or two movies between now and the ceremonies. If they've seen everything everywhere all at once, they've seen Top Gun, they've seen Avatar. What would you say? Like, well, don't miss this one between now and then. I really liked uh, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio movie for Netflix. It's stop motion animated, which is I'm a huge stop motion guy. Another stop motion movie that came out this year that was also nominated was Marcel the Shell with Shoes On, which is also really good. I, I recommend both of those if you're looking at the animated categories. But Del Toro's Pinocchio is just a stunning piece of animated work. I've never seen anything in this format done with such depth and care and breadth. There are things in it that I I'm I still am not entirely sure how he did with mm. uh, with stop motion animation. So that would be one to check out. All right, before we let you go, in your review of Maverick, you proposed a theory. It's been the source of a little bit of controversy uh, among some folks that I read and that I follow online. I'd love to have you sort of make your case. The general theory is that Maverick dies in the first five minutes of the movie or however many it is, for the plane to come apart in that opening scene of the film. And then sort of the rest of the movie is his soul sort of making peace with his life, correct? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the long and the short of it. There's a very straightforward reading of it, which is that this is a movie, so he could survive ejecting from <laughs> right. a cockpit at Mach 10. He right. wouldn't be turned into jelly paste if he did that. <laughs> Sure. OK, but right. let's let's just presume that the physics of the real world hold and he does not survive that ejection. There are little clues, kind of little nuggets dropped throughout that suggest that he has been sent to some sort of purgatory to work out his his issues. Just looking at the film structurally, I mean, if you look at what happens within the movie, he's kind of reliving all of his past triumphs down to the football game on the beach, right? It's, it's a replay of the volleyball game. He has been tasked with performing an impossible to perform thing that is described in the movie as two miracles, right? How many miracles is it that you need to become a saint and there are other things within it uh, the admiral who sends him there i think his name is admiral kane which I, again there's some there's some mm -hmm. resonance there 
so there's a line that this Admiral Kane says to Mav as he is sending him back to Top Gun. Uh, For reasons known only to the Almighty and your guardian angel, you're headed back to Top Gun. All right. That's basically the first line that we get after his crash after the explosion of this airplane at Mach 10. Again, he goes there. He is he is asked to perform two miracles. Uh, so in the in the final dogfight, right, it looks like Maverick is toast. Tom Cruise is toast. He's going to he's going to be taken out. And then who comes swooping in? But Hangman. Hangman comes swooping in. He saves Mavs Bacon in this last dogfight. Right. And what does he say when he's when he's doing so? This is your savior speaking. And he does mm-hmm. it in the tone of voice that can only really be labeled as pilot. It's mm-hmm. it's like a, the 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 voice that you hear when you when you hear uh, that voice is like, that's what a pilot sounds like when I'm flying on an airplane. And Tom Wolfe once in the right in the right stuff, he described it as the drawl of the most righteous of all the possessors of the right stuff. Chuck Yeager. Right. It's an invocation of righteousness. This this idea. Also, it's worth noting that the hangman, uh, his call sign on his airplane is missing two A's. I don't know if anybody caught that. It doesn't have the, it's like like again, Yahweh. Bibli- yeah. it, feel, it feels yeah. like a very biblical, very specifically referential Yahweh moment. Now, of course, all of this is going to get blown out of the water when they make Top Gun Maverick 3 in <laughs> two years. But uh, but like what uh, the, I, I think there's a very strong case to be made here that um, if you if you take a look at all the little individual bits and pieces, it kind of it kind of works out. Yeah, so I, I saw Top Gun twice. We we took the kids to see it, and then they wanted to – my younger daughter wanted to see it a second time, and so we went a second time. And I read your review between the two, and I loved the movie. I thought it was a lot of fun, but I, it was especially interesting to see it the second time, to see the other layer, and to kind of see it as like he is sort of making peace with these unfinished – all the unfinished business in his life, you know, love, you know, uh, Goose's son, all the rest. It was, it was a fun way to read it, so – all right, Sonny. Well, thank you so much for making time for this and, and joining us uh, here at the Bulletin. And thank you all for listening. We will see you next week. The Bulletin is a production of Christianity Today. It's executive produced by Eric Petrick. It's produced by Matt Stevens. Hosted by Russell Moore and Mike Cosper. Azure Phelps is our associate producer. The show is edited and mixed by TJ Hester. Graphic design by Brian Todd, music by Dan Phelps, and social media by Kate Lucky.